Well, excellencies, ladies and gentlemen, hello and uh, welcome to this session at the 54th annual meeting of the Board of Governors of the Asian Development Bank. I'm the moderator for this session. My name is Zainab Badawi, and it's great to be with all of you. Now, what is this session going to be talking about? Well, it's called Raising the Bar on Climate Ambition, the Road to COP26. So a great deal to discuss. And you know, of course, there are two defining issues, aren't there, of our generation, which is responding to the COVID-19 pandemic and also responding to climate change. And it is not an either or situation. We need to do both and we need to do it collectively. But also developed countries have got to ensure that they make available the finance and technology that is needed for the developing countries to meet their own targets, but not only to meet targets on reducing greenhouse gas emissions, but also in building adaptation and resilience, because of course in tackling climate change it is not only about mitigation. And so what we want to explore in this seminar is what kind <coughs> of solutions we can all bring about and where are there practice to ensure that we meet the targets set out in the Paris Agreement. I've got a great lineup of speakers, but I also want you listening to this event to use the Q&A function and send me your questions. I've got my uh, iPad here and I'll try and incorporate as many as possible. So let's go to our first speaker. <coughs> Alok Sharma is the um, president designate for COP26, which of course is being hosted by the United Kingdom in Glasgow, Scotland in November this year. And prior to this, he was a, a cabinet uh, minister responsible for business, energy, industrial policy, and lots of other things. And he also previously had a stint as international development secretary. So Alok Sharma, please set the scene for us and just tell us what kind of vision the UK has for the COP26 presidency, and also how can the Asian Development Bank and its 68 members help in delivering this vision? Thank you, Alex John. Thank you, Zainab. Um, the past 12 months have been one of the most challenging periods faced by humanity in modern times, and uh, world governments have responded. They've collectively deployed trillions of dollars, particularly in developed nations, to support lives and livelihoods. And we've also seen what the Asian Development Bank has done when faced with the COVID crisis, a $20 billion response package and providing a $9 billion facility to help developing member states uh, access and distribute COVID-19 vaccines. <clears throat> and yet, whilst the world has been battling the COVID pandemic, the other ever advancing and existential threat of climate change has not taken time off. And if we are really serious about climate action, we must show the same urgency and resolve in tackling climate change as we have COVID. Right now, the world is some way away from meeting the goals of the Paris Agreement. And the ever stronger effects of climate change are being felt across the world, across Asia. We, my friends, are heading for average temperature rises of over two degrees. And for very many millions of people across the world, that spells catastrophe. So we have less than a decade left to keep Paris's 1.5 degrees target within reach. And that will require us to halve our emissions by 2030. So COP26 has to be the moment we get the world on track to make the, Paris, the goals of the Paris Agreement a reality and to keep that 1.5 alive. And to do that, we have four goals for the UK COP presidency. First, to put the world on a path to net zero emissions by the middle of the century with ambitious national 2030 emissions reduction targets along the way. Second, to boost adaptation. Third, to get finance flowing to climate action. And fourth, for us to work together relentlessly by enhancing international collaboration on critical issues like clean energy and nature so that we can get this green transition moving faster. Countries mounting clean recoveries to the COVID-19 pandemic is absolutely vital. <laughs> and of course, with the Asia Pacific's bloom, booming energy demand, actions on a clean energy transition in this region will determine whether or not we achieve our aims. And of course, that makes the world of work of the ADB absolutely vital because finance underpins all climate action. And therefore, I call on the ADB to do all it can 
to support the efforts of countries in the region to deliver on their emissions reduction targets. Uh, take, for example, scaling up programs like the NDC Advanced Platform to support developing countries with national climate plans, or indeed improving access to climate finance, particularly for the most vulnerable, and then setting an ambitious target of the proportion of his climate finance which goes to adaptation, whilst, of course, also increasing support for nature-based solutions. Investing in climate action as part of a green recovery is not only good for the planet, quite frankly, it is sound economics. Every $1 that is invested in adaptation sees up to $10 in benefits. And the global move to green growth creates huge commercial opportunities. The investment in renewables can create more jobs than their fossil fuel equivalents. And indeed, a recent report published by the University of Oxford highlights that investment in renewables infrastructure can create more than twice as many jobs as the equivalent in fossil fuels. The cost of wind power has dropped by almost 50% since 2010. The cost of solar energy has dropped by a staggering 80% over the same period. Renewables are now cheaper than new coal and gas in the majority of the world, and the costs keep falling. Meeting the goals of the Paris Agreement doesn't mean weaker economies, quite the contrary. So I urge all countries to invest in green recoveries. And I, of course, welcome the ADB's Green Recovery Program in South, Southeast Asia. By contrast, investing in coal runs a very real risk of stranded assets. $630 billion worth if the existing coal pipeline goes ahead, according to Carbon Tracker. And putting an end to coal is essential if we are to keep the 1.5 degree target within reach. Today, global coal use trends are driven primarily by Asia. So I urge all countries in the region to phase out domestic coal use and end international financing of coal plants. Pakistan and the Philippines have said no to new coal. Korea has vowed to end overseas coal finance. The tide is turning towards cheaper, cleaner power, but the time for action is now. And of course, I very much commend the ADB's proposals to formally end all coal financing in its own new energy policy. I also recognize your target to invest $80 billion in climate finance by 2030. But in this vital year for climate, I urge you to go further. Make a more stretching target for the proportion of the bank's funding that is climate finance. Increase efforts to mobilize more private climate finance. Use your energy policy to end support for fossil fuels, except gas in exceptional circumstances. Set a date by which you will align all your operations with the Paris Agreement, as indeed the World Bank and others are doing. And use your role as chair of the joint MDB Paris alignment process to urge other MDBs to do the same. And indeed, while the other MDBs sign a joint statement on nature at COP26. The role of this region and its institutions is absolutely pivotal, and it will determine how and if we secure our future. Finally, I say this to all friends at this event. If ever there was a cause which deserved vigorous multilateral engagement, climate action is it. If ever there was a time to elevate the response to climate change and biodiversity loss, this is that time. There will be no second chances. So let's work together and make this the year that we put the world on a path to a green recovery. And in doing so, make the goals of the Paris Agreement a reality. Thank you. Thank you so much indeed, um, Alok Sharma, for giving us um, that context, uh, setting the scene for our discussions. Um, let me now go to Ignacio Visco, who is the governor for Italy in the Asian Development Bank, and you're also governor of the Bank of Italy, and you also have had a considerable stint at the OECD as a chief economist um, there. And I'm glad you've taken yourself off mute now, Ignacio Visco, if I could ask everybody else to go on mute um, if they're not speaking for the time being, that I'd be very grateful. And um, Ignacio Visco, so Italy has assumed the chairmanship of the G20, and so therefore you're a partner with the UK in COP26's presidency. So you have a very important strategic role to play in advancing the discussion on climate action and also finance. So I wonder if you could just tell us a bit about uh, your plans to ensure that um, there are efforts which are well coordinated 
in uh, tackling both climate change and the COVID-19 recovery. Thank you. Yes, thank you. Thank you very much, Zainab. Thank you for these words. Climate change and the pandemic are the most important global problems of our times. And the two phenomena are related as many of the root causes of climate change, such as deforestation and the loss of habitat by increasing the chance of contact between people and wildlife also amplify the risk of new pandemics. Arresting climate change requires achieving net zero greenhouse gas emissions at a global scale by mid-century, as has just been said. And it is an urgent task. Acting later can be extremely costly and may turn out to be ineffective. But shifting economic development towards a sustainable path is a difficult pro process, and all human activities have to facilitate it. A successful transition requires, therefore, strong global cooperation. This transformation is more demanding for emerging and developing economies, characterized by an increasing thirst for energy driven by industrialization and the rising consumption. Many of them are still heavily reliant on coal to produce energy. In addition, they still need to provide energy access to almost 1 billion people living without electricity, which is a daunting task to undertake while at the same time decarbonizing the economy. The current economic recovery provides a one-time chance to foster necessary changes. As, as the G20 finance ministers and central bank governors recently recognized, we need to shape the recovery by investing in innovative technologies and promoting just transition toward more sustainable economies and societies. In this perspective, uh, multilateral development banks can provide a key con contribution. Since 2017, they have been granting developing countries almost $200 billion per year. And certainly the ADB role has been very important, it is very important in the region, partly going to climate mitigation and end adaptation process projects. Within the G20 Sustainable Finance Working Group, a work stream has been created to enhance the alignment of this contribution with the goals of the Paris Agreement. And we will discuss this in our next meeting starting in July. Sharing best practices for classifying and monitoring sustainable investments will help to identify how they can effectively catalyze private resources and support climate finance. And indeed, most investment will necessarily be privately financed. This will require putting in place adequate institutional and regulatory frameworks, as well as appropriate and predictable carbon prices. Multilateral development banks can also play a pivotal role in further expanding the use of debt for nature swaps. These can improve biodiversity and the provision of ecosystem services while increasing carbon dioxide natural removals, which are strongly needed to achieve net zero targets. These are some of the key issues on the agenda of the Venice Conference on Climate to be held this July. And this is a conference that is undertaken by the Italian G20 presidency, also with the uh, Italian COP26 component of the COP26 uh, presidency. Since the Paris Agreement was signed five years ago, the climate emergency has considerably worsened. The close international cooperation that has been taking place over the last few months is the hoped for premise that this year will be a turning point in the fight against climate change. The G20, by discussing the tools available for a transition to net zero emissions, including disclosures, data, data gaps, and, uh, and a number of other metrics that are needed in order really to put in practice all, all our objectives, will pave the way for the next COP26, where new country commitments to reduce carbon emissions will be taken, hopefully transforming good intentions into concrete actions. Thank you very much. Thank you very much indeed, uh, Governor, and also for making that very important point about access to energy for a billion people who don't um, have power. Um, thank you, and also reminding us about the uh, Venice Summit um, this summer. Uh, let me go now to Sri Mulyani Indrawati, who is the Minister of Finance of Indonesia and also is the Governor um, of, of, for the Republic. Indonesia in the Asian um, Development Bank. Your second stint as Minister of Finance in Indonesia, you had an interruption where you went to the World Bank and became Managing Director there as well as Chief Operating Officer. Srimulyan Indrawati, 
Look, we've heard a great deal about how, you know, obviously developing Asia has suffered a lot during the COVID-19 pandemic. 78 million people have been impoverished as a result of the pandemic. And therefore governments are really trying to ensure that they can meet their needs. But how can you do that whilst at the same time ensuring that you give important consideration to climate change? You know, it's, it's a forced dichotomy, isn't it? It's not one or the other, you've got to do both. So just tell us how Indonesia is tackling this. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Zainab, uh, for this event. I think this is really the very tough trade-off as, as well as choice. Uh, although you mentioned earlier, it should not to be a cho cho choosing between COVID or climate change. But given the situation at this very moment, many countries definitely will focus on a climate, uh, on a COVID-19. When you can manage the COVID, then you are going to be able to recover the economy. Indonesia, in this case, uh, suffered minus 2.1% last year when we hit by this COVID. And we are now in the path of a recovery. Of course, uh, from the fiscal point of view, we use our fiscal policy to counter cyclical, the COVID uh, related contraction, and that's widen the deficit into 6.1%, maybe relatively modest in terms of the contraction as well as uh, the uh, budget uh, deficit that we are having. Uh, for us, in order to recover, we definitely then can put this climate change within the perspective of strategy recovering while also addressing the climate change. This is what the President Jokowi has already mentioned in many events, that we should not put the climate change as a second priority. And that's why the discussion regarding the design of the recovery is going to be very critical. Health issue is definitely still the main priority, and then supporting many of the vulnerable households with the social safety net also becoming critical. But within that kind of support, we can design what we call it labor intensive, for example, reforestation or mangrove planting, which is going to also allowing us to address the issue of uh, climate change. Don't forget Indonesia uh, is among the biggest uh, tropical forests and that's why it's very critical for us to limit or to prevent deforestation or even to reforest uh, uh, all the land which is available. As of now, we've already put in the national medium term development plan for this action plan, both for mitigation and adaptation. And we will prioritize our resources in order for us to be able to support both uh, the climate change agenda and recovering the economy from the COVID. We allocate 4.1% of our state budget for climate action and we use tracking or budget tagging for us to be able to be consistent, credible, and transparent regarding the resources which is required for uh, making our, our nationally determined contribution to be delivered. And that is one of the accountability that we built and we, uh, we established. Of course, climate uh, budget tagging should be widened or spreading to the local level because Indonesia as many provincial and city or municipality. And as of now, we try to push that to the local level because at the local level government, the choice between whether you are preserving the forest with providing job to the people is gonna be very critical. And that's why we will provide resources for them to be able to make the right choice. We also design, for example, providing job for the people to take care of the forest rather than cutting the tree. That's also one of the area that we can provide in creating job when unemployment, unemployment increased uh, slightly because of this COVID. Uh, on the fiscal side, we also use many instruments, for example, like the green bonds, as well as uh, uh, using the agency, which is dedicated for resource mobilization for climate and environmental action uh, financing. This is very critical, Zainab, because you all know, and you mentioned earlier, climate change cannot be delivered without financing and technology. So for us to deliver NDC, we have to be consistent with the financing. And we use our fiscal, we also use private sector philanthropic, 
uh, source of financing, but we also want to urge at the international level the delivery of the financing, which mentioned by Ignacio earlier. I think this is going to be very critical in order for all of us to be able to deliver the commitment in order for us to prevent this climate change disaster. As a co-chairing for the Finance Minister Coalition for Climate Change, I also want to urge for the next COP26 in, uh, in Glasgow, uh, how we are going to be able to establish a better and stronger mutual understanding and responsibility between developing and developed country to deliver the most effective outcome to deal with the climate change issue. I think many technology invention on the renewable energy is really providing a lot of promising uh, option for many developing country in order for them to be able to increase the electricity ratio but without uh, creating a worsening CO2 emission. But again, the question is all about uh, financing. So it is important on a COP26 to stress the important role of climate finance, especially in fulfilling the obligation of developed country to realize the commitment of 100 billion per year by 2020 and set a new collective quantified goal post 2020 from the floor 100 billion US dollar per year. And then also we really need on the financing side, uh, how we are going to implement the Article 6 Paris Agreement in order for us to be able to create one carbon market globally and carbon pricing, which is credible enough to motivate or to incentivize, including private sector. So that this kind of agreement, the Article 6 in which country or jurisdiction can collaborate with other in order for us to be able to address the issue of climate change globally uh, can be implemented in a credible way. I think this is going to be one of the most important uh, issue. Indonesia is now preparing for the carbon market and carbon price mechanism that will be uh, established with the presidential decree. We also discuss with our financial sector authority who's going to govern and uh, control and monitor this uh, mechanism, carbon market mechanism that is credible enough. Last thing, Zainab, I think the most important also is for the financial sector regulators. Uh, climate change can be delivered when the regulation and the finan financial sector also put into account the cost, which is not immediate, but in the future related to the climate change meaning the risk uh, uh, framework on the financial sector should be important. The work of the Financial Stability Board, I think is very critical. I'm also very much support this one. And we discussed with Financial Service Authority within the Republic of Indonesia to be able to anticipate this trend of risk framework uh, by including climate change within the financial sector. I think this is going to be one of the most important. So again, financing, uh, carbon price and carbon market, regulation, which is important, and the commitment that need to be delivered is going to be very, very critical for all of us to be able to address the issue of climate change. And within this kind of context, I think I'm also very optimistic that we can and we will be able to design the recovery of the economy from this pandemic COVID-19, while at the same time addressing the issue of climate change in a credible uh, and accountable way. Thank you so much, Zena. Thank you very much indeed, Sri Mulyani Indrawati, for setting that out very clearly, the need for finance and also the use of innovative financial instruments. You mentioned green bonds there as well, and also carbon pricing. So I'm sure we'll touch on these issues and our other speakers um, will too. Um, let me turn now to um, Ayaz Sayed Kayum, who is the, um, the governor for the Republic of Fiji and also minister for the economy, public enterprises, the civil services, um, communications, as well as being attorney general. So a lot of hats you're wearing there. You're also a member of um, the Global Commission on Adaptation. And that's what I, I think it would be good for you to address, um, Minister, because of course, 
adaptation and resilience is so important for the Asia Pacific region. And it's something which has been overlooked in the past. And now there is a lot of effort in trying to ensure that there is adequate financing to building long-term resilience and adaptation. Um, I know that Fiji is working alongside the United Kingdom in setting up a task force on climate finance ahead of COP26. So just share your thoughts for us, please, in this area of adaptation and resilience on what your expectations are for the COP26 presidency. Thank you, Minister. Thank you. Um, uh, thank you, Zainab. And um, uh, also hello to all the other panelists. And a lot of them made some very, very good points, salient points. But as you know, our mantra has been, uh, Zainab, as we met previously, that for us, climate finance actually equals to development finance. And for countries with low carbon footprint, in particular island economies, uh, that climate finance actually means adaptation finance. So financing our development priorities and climate adaptation needs has never been an easy task. And, but COVID-19, of course, has made the task even more difficult and even more urgent. Without predictable source of finance, we face increasing exposure to risks in these unpredictable times. The uh, global estimates for adaptation uh, financing are expected to range from USD 140 billion to 300 billion per annum by 2030. and could rise to between USD 280 billion to 500 billion per annum by 2050. Fiji alone would require about 4.6 uh, billion US dollars by 2030 to adequately ingrain adaptation and resilience into our development agenda. Achieving the global uh, goal on adaptation set forth in Paris Agreement is intrinsically linked to rapidly achieving significant global decarbonization, simply because greater climate mitigation today reduces the need for uh, climate adaptation tomorrow. Every country must ensure the NDCs have a 2030 commitment that is consistent with what the science requires of us. This means no backsliding, no shortfalls, and no deferrals. The next 10 years will define the next 100 years. Fiji, of course, thanks the United States for rejoining the Paris Agreement with greater decarbonization commitments. Um, and in fact, uh, your leadership in global affairs, of course, defined history in many other instances, and we hope that it will put to work to solve the existential threat of climate change. Large emitting countries, including USA, should now commit to a 2050 net zero agenda. And our developed oceanic neighbors that have been silent in this space must now commit to bold decarbonization targets. In the lead up to COP26, Pacific Island developing states, and I'm sure other island developing states in the Caribbean and the Indian Ocean, strongly urge the UK COP26 presidency to give loss and damage the attention it requires and indeed deserves. It should not be diluted under the ambit of adaptation and resilience. Fiji fully understands that this is a red line issue for most developed countries, but we extend our full support to help the COP26 presidency find and mobilize the resources that will be needed in the spirit of the Warsaw International Mechanism on Loss and Damage. I'd like to just very quickly uh, perhaps go on to some of the key points that we think that Fiji uh, would like to urge the COP26 Presidency. And indeed, and I just want to take a side uh, bar on this. We are working with the UK government to uh, looking at issuing a blue bond. As you know, we've issued a green bond with the help of the World Bank a couple of years ago. It's now listed on the London Stock Exchange. But we you know we are small countries, but large oceanic nations, as they say. So we want to take advantage of the blue economy, and we're working with the UK government to issue some blue bonds. But I think some of the you know issues perhaps the COP26 presidency should look at. Um, and other UNFC, UNFCCC parties to take some specific critical actions. One, finalize Article 6 of the Paris Agreement so they can create a stable source of revenue for the adaptation fund under Article 6.4 in Sustainable Development Mechanisms. The adaptation fund cannot continue to depend on ad hoc handouts to capitalize its coffers. Two, establish a formal process to set a definitive post-2025 um, goal on climate finance from a baseline of US 100 billion per year. This must include a standalone goal on adaptation finance to ensure that adequate support is provided to developing countries to implement the adaptation plans. Such goals must take into consideration the 2023 global stock take, latest signs from the IPC, IPCCC, global warming impact scenarios, and realized mitigation ambitions. Last but not least, and very importantly, Building on the Ocean Dialogue, organized by the subsidiary body 
on Scientific and Technical Advice, which uh, SIPSTA, in December 2020. COP26 should establish a mandated process to incorporate oceans into the UNFCCC agenda. Financing for the climate and ocean nexus should be new and additional to the US $100 billion financing target and must be included in the post-2025 goal on climate finance. We, of course, uh, seek support in this regard and for the entire uh, ocean's agenda in itself. So I think, you know, I, I'd like to end my comments then, then because, I mean, now I should say, because I think there's a number of issues that has been highlighted. We can eke those out perhaps in the question and answer session, but I wanted to highlight those three key important points going forward. Thank you so much indeed, Minister, and especially the point about the blue um, economy, which, of course, as you know, um, the oceans and the seas and the rivers form such an important part of food systems for so many people in the Asia Pacific um, region and for highlighting the amount of investment that's needed for developing countries to fulfil their commitments. I think actually there's a figure of something like three and a half trillion dollars in investment and needed over the next decade for developing countries to meet those commitments. So let me turn now to um, American former Senator John Kerry, also former US Secretary of State. And um, in January, John Kerry, you were sworn in as the first special presidential envoy for climate change. And you're also the first principal to sit um, on the National Security Council, entirely dedicated to climate change, seen very much as a reflection of the commitment that President Joe Biden has to this agenda. So, of course, um, in the last week of April, we saw the Leaders Summit convened by Joe Biden on climate change, and I think that very much raised expectations. So I wonder if you would uh, let us know, do you expect or do you foresee any likely new commitments coming um, from um, economies before the COP26? And also, how, how will the US help maintain the momentum that's being created? Thank you. Well, thank you very much. It's a privilege to be with everybody, um, most of whom we all sort of know each other now and we're getting used to our words, um, which is a little bit what concerns me, if I may say so very directly to everybody. Um, we um, all know what we have to get done here. Uh, there's no question about it at this point in time. But I hate to say it, uh, we're sort of inching along. We're not actually getting it done. Uh, emissions are going up. Uh, we're on the wrong track. People are building back from COVID as if there was uh, no reason to be thinking differently. Um, and while some are deeply engaged in terrific, unbelievable efforts, and for many, like the governor of Fiji and the island states and so forth, this is just plain survival. Uh, when I talk to some of the island state leaders, they, they are not just considering adaptation and resilience, they're considering where they're going to move to. Uh, it's, it's beyond existential. Uh, and and 20 countries equal 81% of all the emissions. Do I see those 20 countries all moving in the same direction? No. At our summit, uh, we, and we're very grateful for this, a lot of people came together. I'll be very honest. Uh, obviously, there was reason for people to be annoyed at the United States for four years of absence. We recognize that and we have humility about it, but we can't sit around moping on it. <laughs> We've got to get the job done. Um, that we have to get done. We're at 1.2 degrees now. We're aiming to try to hold the Earth's temperature at 1.5 degrees. What was good about what happened in, in the summit beyond everybody participating, which was good, and we appreciate that enormously, but 55% of the world's global GDP came together saying, we're going to target NDCs that will keep us at 1.5 degrees. So. 55% of the world has accepted to take the measures necessary now to get the 1.5 degrees. And the reason this is so urgent is it's not a matter of trying to corner people or push people to do something that's unreasonable. It's a matter of trying to do what we know is necessary to get the job done. We're leaders of countries. And as leaders of countries responsible in the 20 for the world's vast majority of the emissions, we do have a special responsibility to help get the job done. And that means targeting the 1.5 degrees with reality. 
So I remind everybody that the Paris Agreement said well below two degrees or 1.5 if possible. Well, well below two degrees is not 1.9, it's not 1.8, it's not 1.7, I don't think. And, and so we need to get where we're going here. We can't get there without adequate finance. And the feedback loops, Mother Earth herself is telling us every week, every day, we already have fires that are out of control. It's the month of May. And we have fires that are out of control in parts of the world. And we know what's happening with the Arctic ice melt and other things. So we really do have urgency here. But I ask you genuinely, do you believe every nation is behaving with that sense of urgency, that we've come together in the way we have to, to be able to get the job done? Alok said a moment ago, and, and he and I probably need to compare notes on this, but he said, you know, above two degrees, I, I have heard from a number of scientists that we're on a course to hit well over three degrees, and some people will assert four degrees, over four degrees. Now, I don't know which is true. I honestly don't. It's not worth the fight because anything over two is pretty disastrous. But if people are of science are telling you we have this threat, we have to deal with it. So we've brought together finance. Across the world now, people are making a decision this is the largest market the world's ever known. Let's take advantage of it. Normal economic principles will work where there is sufficient economic opportunity. But let's face it, there are places where adaptation and resilience don't offer the same commercial deal that mitigation will, because it doesn't have the revenue stream, or as of yet, it doesn't. So we need to be creative in the ways we're going to finance. And I think we need to push to do a number of things. Number one, ensure that the MDBs are meeting their climate finance targets and that they're setting new and ambitious targets. We'd like to see a higher target set by the ADB. Second, support countries to design, finance, and implement ambitious NDCs. This is critical in the run-up to Glasgow. And we encourage the Asia Development Bank to fully align with the Paris Agreement with a clear timetable. Third, the MDB should do more to build the capacity of countries to measure and manage climate risk and build the resilience of communities and economies uh, to the impacts of climate change. And obviously, resilience and adaptation are just tougher. And we have to understand that as we try to work at how you provide the money. There's going to have to be more concessionary money. Uh, we aren't even at the 100 billion yet, let alone the further concessionary money we need. And finally, we need to ensure that banks, uh, investors do no harm. And that means bluntly ending the financing for coal projects and putting in place a framework for phasing out other fossil fuel investments over time while supporting countries that make the transition uh, to net zero. And in the case of the ADB, we would like to see a more restrictive fossil fuel financing policy. But the bottom line is there really is no excuse for someone building a coal plant. And, and I know people say, well, we have a contract. My friends, force majeure is a rationale for not pursuing a contract that does harm. And we are in the midst of a force majeure with respect to what is happening with climate crisis. So anybody who has not broken ground should not break ground on a new coal plant. It really is just that simple. Thank you. Thank you so much indeed, Mr. Secretary. Well, our next speaker is President Massa, who is uh, president, of course, of the Asian Development Bank. And President Massa, this session is called, called Raising the Bar on Climate Ambition. And that is exactly what Mr. Secretary is urging the Asian Development Bank to do. It's often said that the battle against climate change can be won or lost in the Asia Pacific region. So your response please, and tell us what you are doing to meet all these challenges. Thank you. Yeah, thank you, Zena. Actually, already uh, I'm under enormous pressure <laughs> uh, by many, many people to raise our bar in terms of uh, climate financing and so on. Uh, but uh, let me start by saying that uh, Asia and Pacific uh, faces uh, some uncomfortable truths. Uh, first, uh, as you know, uh, this region is responsible for around 50% of global green gas emissions. And the recent analysis predicts 
uh, that the global energy related CO2 emissions will grow uh, by close to 5% in 2021 uh, as demand for coal, oil, and gas rebounds. And more than 80% of the projected growth in coal uh, demand will be from Asia. Uh, without decarbonizing our energy systems, the goals of the Paris Agreement will be beyond reach. And second, uh, the Asia-Pacific region is experiencing a sharp increase in climate shocks and stresses. Floods, droughts, cyclones, and heat stresses are already impacting livelihood, uh, food, and water security, and the health of millions of people, especially vulnerable populations, including women and children, and the poorest of the poor. More than 60% of the people in the region work in the sectors highly susceptible, uh, susceptible uh, to changing weather patterns. And so we must invest more in climate adaptation because we are now dangerously close to the point uh, where action could come too little too late. In this regard, we have to listen to the voice of small islands developing, developing states. As Minister Said Kayum has stressed often, uh, Fiji and other Pacific island nations bear the brunt of climate change. They are rightly uh, calling for deeper international collaboration to help uh, build their resilience to severe storms, uh, rising uh, sea levels, and changing weather patterns uh, that are threatening uh, their existence. To help developing member uh, countries address uh, these existential challenges, uh, existential challenges, ADB will expand our investment and strengthen our approach in tackling the impact of climate change. Let me highlight briefly uh, five concrete actions. First, ADB will enhance its investment in adaptation and resilience uh, in various ways so that our climate finance will be more balanced between mitigation and adaptation. Some examples are of investments that promote uh, nature-based sol solutions, such as mangroves uh, for coastal resilience, uh, flat risk management, related infrastructure, and climate smart livelihood practices, uh, such as agroforestry. Second, ADB will take a holistic approach uh, to enhancing adaptation and resilience. In addition to making physical infrastructure climate proof, we also invest in more projects uh, with climate adaptation as their primary purpose. ADB will promote strong integration of the ecological, social, institutional, and financial aspects of resilience across our operations. Third, ADB provides additional grant resources to incentivize poor and vulnerable countries to take on climate and disaster resilience projects. A new thematic pool in so-called Asian Development Fund, ADF-13, uh, which is a grant window for the most poor and the vulnerable countries, will serve for this purpose. We also commit uh, just a share of ADF-13 uh, financing for climate adaptation and mitigation will be at least 35% in volume and at least 65% of committed ADF-13 operations in number of projects. I will support climate mitigation and adaptation by 2024. Fourth, ADB will strengthen community-based approach. We are working with the UK, Nordic Development Fund, and other financial institutions and global climate funds to roll out an ambitious community resilience partnership program uh, that will support both governments and communities in Asia and the Pacific in their efforts to scale up pro-poor resilience investments. And finally, fifth, and most importantly, we will hold firm on our ambitious climate finance target uh, there by 2030, 75% of the total number of ADB's operation will support uh, either uh, adaptation or mitigation, climate action, uh, while climate finance uh, from ADB's own resources will reach uh, 80 billion US dollars cumulatively uh, by 2030. We will continue to help uh, development member countries achieve and even increase uh, their Paris Agreement commitments while uh, charting a fair and equitable path 
uh, to net zero through various programs focusing on NDCs, carbon markets, and the development of sound and ambitious long-term national uh, strategies. Uh, let me close by noting uh, that ADB is committed to aligning our operations with the Paris Agreement. Uh, in, in line with this, uh, we will be finalizing our new energy policy in time for COP26. Uh, let me stop here. Thank you. Thank you very much indeed, President Massa, and we look forward to seeing what is in that new policy ahead of um, COP26. Um, so uh, let me turn now to Dr. Jun Ma, who is chairman of the Green Finance Committee of the China Society um, for Finance and Banking. And um, Dr. Ma, you know, you've had a, a very long career working in green um, finance, both domestically and internationally. You worked at Deutsche Bank for a while, also a stint at the IMF and the World Bank. So you've got real expertise in innovative climate actions and strategies, um, in particular what China is implementing with its new um, ambitious commitments on carbon neutrality by um, 2060. So just outline for us what further steps you think countries in the Asia Pacific region could undertake in order to mobilize more green finance, both domestically and um, internationally to meet their climate commitments. Thank you. Well, first of all, I'd like to thank uh, ADB for hosting this uh, session on climate ambition, and uh, it's really my honor and pleasure to be part of the discussion. Now, let me start by sharing some recent developments in China in the area of green and sustainable finance. I will touch upon some of the new initiatives that are being taken or being considered in China on uh, implementing the uh, carbon neutrality goal that's announced by President Xi Jinping last year. And I also see a few words on international cooperation, especially on the uh, few initiatives that China has been uh, deeply involved in. Um, starting with domestic work on green finance, uh, in the past few years, China has developed uh, what I call a framework of green financial system, uh, which is supported by five pillars. One is uh, taxonomy, which is a definition of green activities that finance uh, should support. And we so far have three taxonomies already. One is for green lending, one is for green bonds, and one is for green projects. And the second pillar is what we call disclosure requirement because a lot of green projects uh, will need to uh, report and disclose their uh, environmental and climate information so that they can attract uh, the uh, real green money. Um, that's why we have um, developed some mandatory, uh, some semi-compulsory requirements for companies uh, to disclose such information. And the third pillar is uh, what we call incentives, because some green projects, even though they have uh, green benefits, uh, such as reducing carbon or reducing pollution, but they may not be profitable enough for a while. And uh, therefore, they are unable to attract uh, sufficient private sector financing. That's why we need, uh, for at least for a period of time, uh, providing some incentive from the fiscal authority, from central bank and other regulators. Just give you one example, as early as in 2017, the Central Bank of China introduced the green relanding facility, which offers low cost funding through the banking system to green projects. And at the local level, some regional uh, authorities using their fiscal um, resources to subsidize interest payments uh, for green projects. Mm -hmm. And all of these uh, uh, lower the funding cost of the uh, green projects and enhance the return and thereby crowding in private sector financing. And the fourth pillar is what I call a suite of financial products because we need lots of products to meet the different demands uh, from the uh, real economy for uh, um, green and sustainable financing. That's why we have developed a uh, system of uh, green loans, green bonds, green funds, uh, green ABS, green ETF, green insurance, and so on. As of now, we have uh, 12 trillion RMB worth of outstanding green loans. And uh, in the past five years, we issued 1.3 trillion RMB worth of green bonds. And this market is still growing at about 100% this year in the first few years, in the first few months of the year. And uh, we now have 700 green funds, uh, largely private equity type of uh, green funds. Um, the fifth pillar is what I call regional pilot schemes, because China is so large, different regions have uh, uh, different priorities and different um, uh, conditions. 
and uh, uh, they need to experiment their own ways of promoting green sustainable finance. Um, for example, in Hojo, one of the uh, green finance pilot region, uh, they launched uh, a e-platform matching green finance from the 20 something banks and the green projects from the economy. And uh, over the year, uh, uh, after they launched the uh, e-platform, they matched, uh, I think, one than, uh, more than 100 billion RMB worth of green financing. So it's a, a very effective way of reducing information asymmetry between money and uh, the projects. Now, looking forward, we will further improve the green financial system to make it more consistent with the carbon neutrality goals. Um, looking at the uh, standard side, namely the uh, uh, taxonomy, we have actually just removed clean code technology uh, from the uh, green bond taxonomy uh, that's uh, issued at a second edition by the central bank. And we're going to further uh, revise the uh, uh, green taxonomy in other uh, areas, such as the green loans and uh, green projects to make sure that uh, uh, these uh, standards are fully consistent uh, with the, the net zero objective. Secondly, uh, we will move towards a mandatory requirement for environmental and climate information disclosure for corporates and for financial institutions. I expect in the future, the banks will be required to uh, disclose information on the carbon footprint of their loans, uh, which is a big task because we need to ask all the companies that they lend to, uh, to begin report the uh, carbon related information uh, to them. And also we need to improve the uh, incentives further uh, for example, uh, we can engineer a much larger relanding facility uh, just to support the low carbon projects. And we can consider reducing risk weights for bank loans, uh, depending on the uh, uh, greenness of the uh, uh, projects. If a project is greener, I think the risk weights can be lowered. If the project is brown, uh, the risk weights can be increased, thereby further reducing the funding cost for green activities and raising the uh, funding cost for high carbon activities. And uh, we should also introduce environmental risk analysis methodologies uh, throughout the financial system. In fact, we began to promote the ERA or environmental risk analysis methodology uh, within the banking system. So far, a couple of major banks have introduced a stress testing scenario analysis methodology, but we need to do more in uh, many other banks as well as in the insurance sector and asset management industries. And finally, we should encourage further product innovation such as the carbon footprint linked loans and bonds and transition finance products, uh, which is uh, assisting the high carbon uh, industries and companies to uh, <clears throat> transform themselves into low carbon and even zero carbon uh, um, uh, activities. In fact, uh, I was talking to a team led by Mr. Saeed, uh, vice president of ADB recently, on the possibility of uh, designing a transition finance project in China, uh, which will help a uh, for example, coal-fired power generated in China to become a renewable company uh, in the not very distant future. Now, finally, just a few words on some of the international initiatives that uh, China has been deeply involved in. One is the uh, G20 uh, sustainable finance work. As you probably know, in 2016, when China was a G20 presidency, we launched the uh, G20 Green Finance Study Group. And I had the honor to uh, co-chair that study group with uh, our UK colleagues. And that study group lasted for three years between 2016 and 2018. Uh, it did not continue in the last two years, but uh, early this year under the Italian presidency, this uh, uh, study group was relaunched and it's now renamed to a G20 Sustainable Finance Working Group. Uh, once again, I have the honor to uh, co-chair this uh, working group together uh, with uh, our U.S. Um, colleague from the Treasury. And uh, <clears throat> under uh, this study group, uh, now it's called the Working Group, we're going to work on four things this year. One is to develop a G20 roadmap for system of finance, which will help uh, guide the G20 work in the coming few years in this area. And secondly, uh, we'll work on improving the uh, consistency and the compatibility of sustainability reporting standards. And thirdly, working on the improvement of compatibility of taxonomies and other alignment methodologies for investments uh, to be consistent with Paris agreements. And finally, uh, working on enhancing the role of MDBs in uh, supporting the Paris agreement. And I'm hoping that uh, these deliverables uh, will have a significant impact on 
uh, sustainable finance agenda globally. Now, the second in the international initiative I'd like to mention briefly is IPSF. It's uh, the International Platform for Sustainable Finance. Under that, a working group was formed on sustainable finance taxonomy. As many of you know, uh, there are now too many taxonomies defining what is green uh, for the financial sector. And uh, I heard there are now 200 taxonomies already. Some are done by the country, some are done by industrial association, some are designed by companies, some designed by financial institutions. Um, the proliferation of taxonomies will likely to create confusion, increasing transaction cost, and probably some problems leading to greenwashing. Uh, that's why improving the uh, consistency and finding a way to harmonize taxonomies globally, I think it's important. And uh, uh, again, I have honored to co-chair this uh, working group under the IPFS, uh, which is now uh, co-chaired by China and the EU. Our goal is to uh, produce a common ground taxonomy. Um, it's uh, the first version uh, will come out in the second half of this year. Um, to make sure that uh, between the Chinese taxonomy and European taxonomy, we can find some common ground uh, so that uh, this new version could be used on a voluntary basis by Chinese issuer to issue green bonds in Europe and by European issuer to, green, to issue green bonds in China. And it could be also used by third parties or other jurisdictions on a voluntary basis. Um, now, let me stop here and hand it back to you, uh, the moderator. Thank you. Very much indeed, um, Dr. Jun Ma. Um, uh, an array there, myriad, great detail about the kind of products which are available in green financing and the initiatives in China. Thank you very much indeed. Um, we're now going to go for um, a response, briefer responses from our two leading um, respondents. Let me go to um, Kun Pat Puri, who is a Senior Executive Vice President for Finance and Accounting and Corporate Strategy at BCPG Public Company Limited, which is uh, one of the leading renewable companies in Thailand and indeed in the whole Asia Pacific region. We've heard about the role of the private sector and what that could be. Um, so just give us what is uh, your perspective on the readiness of the private sector in general and BCPG in particular in contributing to a green and resilient and inclusive recovery from the COVID-19 pandemic. Thank you. Yeah, thanks, Sierra. First of all, I would like to thank ADB for inviting me here. Um, let me start with a brief introduction about my company, BCPG first. We are a leading renewable energy producer in Asia Pacific with five technology, solar, wind, geothermal, hydro, and digital energy. We have present in six countries. Our company has the ambition to make the world greener. We aim to double our power generation capacity by 2025. We admit that um, the climate change is real. BCPG plays a part in carrying on the global climate agenda through our renewable power generation business. We try to find innovative technology to maximize both natural resources. For example, we utilize battery storage energy system in our Lombicor power plant in order to store the oversupply electricity during a strong wind period to supply later when there is um, excess demand. This is one of Thailand's sandbox project, and the success of this project will create more and more ESS power plant in our country. Special thanks to ADB for your support on this project as well. The benefit for ADB support is not only just for the project itself, but actually what's more important is it acts as a, an example for others bank to follow. And I think we need to see this kind of things from ADB and other banks as well. Fighting climate change is very complex and we need collaborations. There are a lot of Thai companies who love to be responsible for their carbon emission. BCPG and uh, our parent company, Bangja, are working on establishing a carbon credit trading platform in Thailand. Since we, we believe this will open the door for those companies to join the right to save our planet, we hope that it will be ready and can be up and running when the regulatory is done. Actually, fighting the climate change is a hard and arduous task, 
But hearing from so many like passionate and inspiring speaker today, I believe to our collaborative effort, we can turn the earth green again. Thank you. So much indeed. Um, mm -hmm. Thank you. And um, our next is Barbara Buchner, who's Globing Managing Director of the Climate Policy Initiative with its headquarters in San Francisco, which I know it's an unearthly hour there right now, but you have branches all over the world. Mm -hmm. And Barbara, indeed, you're named as one of the 20 most influential women in climate change, and you advise uh, leaders on climate, um, energy and land use um, investments all over the world. Um, so, Barbara, a, a brief response from you also, you know, climate financing and other means of implementation to support Asia's transition is a very important topic, topic we've been discussing. With your extensive um, experience in both climate policy and finance, where do you see the opportunities in the Asia Pacific region to enhance climate action? And what do you think is needed to realize those opportunities? And if you can do all of that in three or four minutes, then you are truly impressed. Thank you. Well, thank you so much. Good morning, good afternoon, wherever you are. And thank you so much um, to ADB for having me. It's a true pleasure being part of this seminar. Well, I, I think most of us agree that climate action can make business sense. It's good for the people, it's good for the planet. I firmly believe in the opportunity. And as horrible as the, the current pandemic is, it has highlighted a very tight connection between people, economies, environment, and our physical and social infrastructure. So the potential silver lining of the COVID crisis is that it has created more political will to address and fund climate action. In fact, then um, if you look at um, recent announcements, there's numerous Asia and Pacific region countries that have recently announced or updated net zero targets. We see Japan, China, South Korea reducing or are on their path to eliminating all public financing for new overseas coal-fired power plants. And I certainly want to echo as Secretary Kerry said calls for that. The ADB itself has pledged 80 billion US dollars and that 75% of its projects will address climate change by 2030. So the opportunities uh, I think are there at pursuing a low carbon sustainable growth path could actually result in global GDP, economic and social benefits exceeding 26 trillion US dollars by 2030. So I am bullish on the opportunities, but I am concerned about the speed. We need to redouble efforts towards laying a path for a more sustainable, inclusive, resilient world. And for a while now, I've been reinforcing three uh, key success, uh, success factors uh, to scaling up uh, sustainable finance and increasing ambition, particularly as we are building back or are building forward uh, better from the crisis. So let me very briefly share those with you. I think the first um, element is actually echoing a lot of what you heard on this panel already. Government policy should lead the way. Uh, we are seeing very clearly that good policies are key to resourcing a sustainable and resilient recovery, uh, as for example, uh, Mr. Shri Miliani mentioned. Green fiscal policies like carbon pricing or reforming fossil fuel subsidies and green budgeting, green tagging, can be important elements in a government's COVID-19 response toolkit. Why? Well, such approaches remove inefficiencies in public expenditure while raising additional revenue and at the same time align recovery planning this climate objective. And they also send a strong signal about the investment potential of a country. So that's uh, my number one element. My second element, uh, and again, we've heard that also in, in from some of the previous speakers, but we need to use public finance wisely to unlock private capital and to increase impact. I think it's even more clear in the wake of COVID that public finance is essential, but limited resources must be deployed for catalytic impact. And um, in Asia, a recent CPI study finds that the majority of finance um, in COVID stimulus packages is providing tax cuts and bailouts to polluting industries such as coal mining and coal-based electricity. And this is not a good recipe for success. It's putting those public investments at risk of being stranded, diminishing the appetite for foreign investment, and also extending the longer-term negative impacts of fossil fuels such as uh, pollution. So we need government investment to push the boundaries and foster innovation to unlock investment, particularly for the sectors such as adaptation and the geographies that are harder to tackle. And I think, again, Dr. Majun has mentioned a number of potential innovative instruments, but it's not just the sovereigns that need to reframe their investment priorities. Development financial institutions in particular 
have a major role to play um, and expanding their role in a post-COVID green recovery, slightly one of the cheapest and lowest risk ways to finance climate action, building amongst others on their experience with innovative financial instruments. Uh, ADB, uh, I certainly see has a key role to play here and I do wanna echo some of the calls also by Alex Sharma on, on what needs to happen um, with the ADB leadership. And third and finally, uh, we must shift the entire financial system. This is a moment in which all financial actors need to align their portfolios and their counterparts portfolios with a better future. So mainstream is the need of the day and at the heart of this work, is the need for transparency and for better data. What, what you can measure, you, you can manage. So comprehensive reporting on climate risk and moving towards standardized mandatory disclosure is essential. And the initiative to standardize the language and criteria for green projects, such as the Asian green bond standards have the potential to attract climate financing at scale to the region. And uh, I think all this effort should be fast-tracked and I'm very happy to also hear about uh, Dr. Majun's recent updates on harmonizing taxonomies uh, across regions. And then the final point I just wanted to make in parallel, uh, which is something really important to me, there needs to be better accountability and integrity. Financial actors have formed many coalitions and initiatives to promote sustainable finance. And um, however, there's a silent approach um, of these coalitions that makes some challenges difficult to overcome, such as the immediate need for debt relief and restructuring some developing countries, which will require more than one set of financial actors to engage. So we must increase uh, the credibility and accountability of coalition commitments, but also provide the connective tissue between the various coalitions. And uh, as there's a brief view next week, a group of leading organizations representing the entire financial ecosystem will launch uh, something called the Principles for Sustainable Finance Integrity, which will for the first time establish a set of guardrails shared across the public and private sector. So just to conclude, as you see that uh, there is almost boundless opportunities and a strong array of near-term action items that really could accelerate implementation of policies and investments to achieve our mutual goals, which are economic stability, reduced inequality, and a more healthy environment. So especially in the run-up um, to an incredibly important COP uh, meeting this year, I do hope that we all seize this rare moment to make significant and lasting changes with our organizations. And with that, uh, let me hand back to you. Arthur Bookner, thank you very much indeed. Well, alas, you all had so much to say that I really don't have very much time at all for questions. However, if you do answer one, please just keep it short because I will do want to go around everybody at the very end just for their final point. Now, the questions don't just come to me. They also come with the number of people who've supported the asking of this particular question. And the overwhelmingly most popular one is this one. Are governments in the region, Asia Pacific region and in the West, willing to seriously address the huge subsidies provided to the fossil fuel industries? And I believe the figure is something like $500 billion a year is spent on fossil fuel subsidies globally. So who would like to answer that one? Um, Secretary Kerry, perhaps, would you like to kick off on um, the, the subsidies? questioned fossil fuels. If you unmute yourself, Mr. Secretary, if you unmute yourself, thank you. Uh, it's very simple. We have to end the subsidies. I mean, we just have to end the subsidies. It's illogical. At a moment where we all know we have to incentivize alternative, renewable, sustainable, when we know that the massive uh, amount of technology necessary for about 50% of the reductions is is not yet available it's going to come from future technology development and bringing to scale how do we do that we need incentives you must create incentives for the right behavior not the wrong behavior and we still have uh, and we have them in the united states we're going to try to end them they've got to be ended everywhere around the world we've got to provide incentives for those things we need and particularly adaptation resilience, because they don't lend themselves to a commercially viable deal. It's hard to get a PPA on an average uh, adaptation program. But clearly, we can do that for mitigation. It, and, and one other thing, many of these coal-fired power plants, I wish the banks would look at this more closely. I worked for four years to try to get Vietnam off of coal. Vietnam has a virtuous cycle available to it, 45% of its uh, energy could come from the Mekong from hydro. 
They only use 31%. Why? The coal industry. The coal industry blocks it out actively. So we've got to begin to shift and incentives are the most important immediate change we can make. Thank you so much indeed. Does anybody else want to pick up on that particular point, Governor Ignacio Visco or anybody else? No, I've got lots of questions. Would you like to? Yes, Governor Visco, yeah. No, of course, I totally agree. The issue of stopping the subsidies is, is crucial. At the same time, we have to understand how to achieve global pricing, which is uh, obviously uh, in need and many instruments are available. So certainly the incentives that uh, John Kerry mentioned are crucial, but also we have regulation that could be enforced. We have taxation that is something that we are discussing how to, to put in place. And we may have uh, a market for permits, which uh, we started many years ago and they can only work if it is global. So I think the global issue here is crucial. Uh, we have had the starts which were uh, very promising, the Kyoto Agreement, the Paris. Uh, we are now a major opportunity. And, uh, and uh, the fact that here we are all really sharing these views is, is uh, some, something that uh, gives some, at least some cautious optimism to all of us. Thank you. A question in particular to you, President Massa. The Asian Development Bank has been in the front line supporting countries in the region to deal with the pandemic. Did this have an impact on the ADB's climate financing? Can the ADB afford to meet its uh, targets? Briefly on that one, if you would. Okay, uh, very, very, very good question, I think. Uh, in order to uh, achieve uh, the green recovery from this enormous pandemic, and also in order to uh, realize uh, net zero uh, by uh, mid uh, this century, definitely we need to ramp up our you know, climate financing. And as many people have mentioned, uh, ADB has introduced a, a clear uh, numerical target uh, to provide you know, 80 billion uh, US dollars cumulatively uh, between uh, 2019 and 2030 uh, for those uh, 12 years. And if you divide this 80 billion by uh, 12 years, uh, you will come up uh, with uh, uh, approximately uh, 6.7 uh, billion US dollars uh, per year. Uh, that's our you know, yearly target. And if you look at our performance last year, uh, when we suffered you know, uh, enormously from pandemic, our achievement for climate financing was 4.3 billion US dollars, which is well below. <laughs> Uh, yearly target, uh, or you know, in other words, uh, we could say you know, in, in despite of these enormous challenges posed by pandemic, we still could provide you know, 4.3 billion, you know, whatever. But anyhow, it's well below our target. So, but I'm very happy to tell you that you know, if, if I, I, I look, when I looked at uh, the pipeline of the, for this year, I'm quite sure uh, that we will be able to uh, get back to the. Uh, uh, past trajectory, uh, which means, you know, this year, uh, probably we can achieve, you know, more than 6 billion, and definitely we would like to maintain uh, that trend uh, beyond 2021 until 2030 to achieve 80 billion uh, cumulative uh, target uh, for a certain. Uh, that's one thing. Uh, and also, uh, Zainab, uh, if you allow me, uh, let me briefly respond to uh, both uh, Mr. Kerry and also uh, Shamasan uh, by saying uh, that uh, uh, coal financing, uh, while our energy policy uh, is currently being consulted with our uh, shareholders and stakeholders, so so I, I don't want it to be uh, really pre preempt any uh, dec decision of our board, but uh, I can tell you that ADB will definitely uh, try uh, uh, to consider uh, exploring a formal withdrawal uh, from financing new coal power generation and heating. That's one thing. And another thing, uh, Ms. Uh, uh, Ms. Uh, 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 Secretary Kerry's uh, uh, you know, uh, point about uh, Paris alignment. Yes, definitely. Uh, we are also trying hard to, you know, uh, uh, to align our operations uh, with the Paris uh, Agreement as quickly as possible. And our uh, uh, target is that uh, uh, we will announce when we will uh, achieve uh, Paris Alignment by COP20 in November this year. Thank you so much indeed. A brief answer to this question, please, uh, Sri Mulyani Indra Wati. You have assumed the role of co-chair of the Coalition of Finance Ministers on Climate recently. How do you see this group ensuring adequate resource mobilization for a transition out of fossil fuels? Briefly, if you would. 
Well, first, uh, on this coalition, all the finance minister exchange view getting their experience on how they can uh, design the transition, especially on a public finance point of view, which is very critical. Uh, so the experience uh, regarding fossil fuel subsidy removing or redu reduction of this kind of subsidy, which is politically very sensitive, but uh, financially is very critical and commitment to the climate change is also very obvious. The second one, uh, we also discussed regarding the uh, establishing a global framework that will be able to facilitate in a more credible way this climate change commitment. And eventually this is uh, uh, leading to this uh, uh, carbon market and carbon pricing. So the discussing uh, on each country, how they start establishing this carbon market mechanism, as well as even the necessary regulation that can enforce uh, the carbon pricing. But the difficulties is of course, uh, at this very moment, we are not having one global market. So there is a fragmented and each have a, their own uh, prices, which is not uh, creating uh, the right uh, signal for the industry. So I'm glad to hear uh, previously that there is now effort to establish this mechanism more consistently across uh, jurisdiction which is, I think, very critical for the credibility of the carbon market globally, as well as the level of the price, which reflecting uh, the urgency of this climate change. Uh, regarding the financing, I think the discussion about this 100 billion is come up on the discussion on uh, financing, especially, of course, from many developing countries. Currently, we have 60 countries join this coalition, which is increased very significantly. We also have United States now also join this uh, coalition. Uh, and we really want to discuss regarding uh, the credible financing source. The MDB yeah. is one source of financing mechanism is very critical. And I'm glad to hear that the ADB is going to also discuss uh, and help country to, try, uh, to create a just and affordable transition for a country from the current path of the CO2 emission into a lower path of CO2. Thank you very much indeed. One question, brief answer from you, Ayas Sayed Kayuma, a question directly um, for you, which is this one. Oh, where has it gone now? It's, um, no, it's actually gone. I think it was the question, oh yes, here it is. Financing for adaptation has traditionally been lower than mitigation financing. How can we ensure a rebalancing both with international and domestic financing for climate action? Brief answer, if you would. I really am running out of time. Thanks. Um, I think that, as uh, Secretary Kerry said, we just need to simply change the parameters of the ball game. And I think there used to be a lot more emphasis, green climate fund, for example, very low levels of uh, uh, financing for adaptation purposes. But a case in point, we've got most, uh, some of the large shareholders here present. A few years ago, the shareholders, for example, uh, uh, resisted the call to have, for example, middle income countries like Fiji to get concessional financing through the ADB, which is called the uh, ADF funds, which is similar to IDA funds. We have within you know, 36 hours, one third of the value of our GDP wiped off because of a climatic event. And yet we cannot access concessional financing from ADB because the shareholders objected to it. We've been given certain commitments, uh, countries like UK and now I understand on board, but if we can get that uh, across the line, as the World Bank has done, then we'll be able to access concessional financing. It will help us greatly in terms of putting finance towards adaptation and indeed building resilience. Thank you so much indeed. Okay, um, I'm afraid that's all we have time for on the Q&A because I wanted to go around everybody, but I think you have an idea of the kind of questions that came in, you can mull them over. How can developing countries heavily dependent on fossil fuels shift to renewables in line with their commitments to the Paris um, Agreement? Um, as Secretary Kerry, there was one for you. President Biden has announced an ambitious domestic infrastructure agenda, including climate action. When can we expect a re-engagement of the US in terms of significant climate financing. And um, to all the panelists, how can we ensure just transitions in developing countries, how to support communities to make this transition, especially for providing meaningful jobs. But as I said, no time to answer those and uh, many other questions. But I just want to very quickly remind everybody also about the role of indigenous people when we're talking about climate change, because although they only make up 5% of the global population, they protect 
80% of global biodiversity. So I just wanted to stick that particular point in. So I just want to go around everybody one minute only to just say to you, okay, COP26, what are your main expectations and hopes for the outcome of COP26? Um, let me go to the order in which you spoke. So that's Alok Sharma, just a minute, thank you, less. Jenab, thank you. Look, I want to focus on what this discussion is all about, which is that without adequate climate finance, I mean, the task ahead is, is near impossible, quite frankly. Um, and it is, it is as simple as that, and we've heard that from colleagues uh, on this call as well. And basically what this needs is donor countries, it needs the MDBs, it needs the private sector as well uh, to collectively step up uh, to the plate. Um, I mean, the UK has doubled its uh, climate finance commitment over the next uh, five year period. We need everyone to be more ambitious. And that is one of the key areas that I'm going to be driving forward over the next six months. Thank you so much indeed. Governor Ignacio Visco in Italy. Thank you. Yes, thank you. I think that uh, global cooperation is of the essence here. Uh, and I'm very glad that at the end, both the United States and China agreed to co-chair these uh, uh, new uh, or uh, renewed uh, group <laughs> is now a permanent working group on sustainable finance. Obviously, it has to be put together the private component and the public uh, efforts. But I think that the road to COP26 this year is very, very well uh, traced. And I am I'm confident uh, now that uh, we uh, can uh, start really a new trip towards an objective that is shared by all of us with instruments that have, however, still to be refined, especially on the financial front. Thank you. Thank you so much indeed. Minister Srimulyani Indrawati, the governor for Indonesia, brief final remark from you, expectations. Well, I think I agree with the finance is uh, very critical, but we are, should not just talking about 100 billion, which uh, on the COP26, uh, we should be able to quantify more precisely where the source <laughs> and how we are going to distribute based on the priority. We also need to address the issue of the pending issue, Article 6 of the Paris Agreement, especially on the carbon trading. I think this is going to be one of the necessary conditions to have a credible climate change commitment. And the third one, uh, the most important, COP26, uh, we should be able to come up with a mutual understanding between developing and developed country, how we are going to deliver the effective outcome to deal with the climate change. Thank, Thank you. you very much Thank you. Minister Ayo Said Kayu in Fiji. Um, three or four key points. Very quickly, we need to look at things like debt for nature swaps. We need to look at, look at financing for nature-based solutions, whether it's coastal protection, etc. We need to look at innovative financial products where we need to bring in the private sector. And indeed, many of the larger countries can use the convening power of this to bring the private sector to develop things like, for example, ensure resilience, which is critically important. Thank you so much indeed. Secretary John Kerry. Well, first of all, for COP26, uh, uh, we absolutely need to raise ambition. It is not 2050 that needs to be the key in our mind's eye. It is 2030. The decade of 2020 to 2030 is critical. We can't get to 1.5 if we don't do enough in that decade. Secondly, shareholders, please hear this. The future economically is not in fossil fuel. It is not in coal. It is in the new technologies. And the reason these banks and these asset managers are putting up trillions is they recognize that it's green hydrogen, it's direct air capture, it's battery storage. It's a host of different new technologies that the market will demand that we get out of this mess. That's the economic future, and that is where we need to move much more rapidly. Thank you so much indeed. As America has said, this is the decisive decade. Thank you. June Ma, just very briefly, please, your final remark, expectations COP26. Sure. On the uh, ecosystem for sustainable finance, I think we need a more consistent set of taxonomies. We need stronger incentives for green and low carbon activities. We need a disclosure requirement for carbon-related information and more innovative products. And uh, I think all of these will help uh, generate a much larger uh, cross-border green capital flow, which will support the uh, developing countries' uh, low-carbon uh, agenda. And by the time COP26 is held, I hope more countries, companies, and financial institutions 
will have announced specific targets for achieving carbon neutrality. And I'm also hoping that the G20 uh, will have achieved more consensus on coordinated actions in areas such as sustainable finance. Thank you so much indeed. Kun Pat Puri from BCPG, briefly. Okay, yeah, very simple. Um, my is, uh, I think it can apply to everyone, every, any sector, translate commitment into action. First, com real commitment with like clear target timeline. Second, be more creative and innovative in the way that we decide your strategy. Third, take action, just do it and to save our planet. Thank you. Thank you very much. And just 30 seconds, Barbara Buchner, thank you. Thank you so much for two things for me. It's obviously ambition and integrity. So I'd like to see incentives and support for countries who want to raise their ambitions. And I'd like to see that we harness the momentum in the financial sector, but at the same time, really be careful that it's not only implying just talk, but really accountability and integrity, put regulatory requirements, requirements in place, ranging from mandatory reporting to facilitating bringing of finance and focusing on innovative finance. Thank you. And the last word to you, President Massa. Yeah, thank you. And needless to say, as a success of forthcoming uh, COP26 is everybody's interest, everybody's benefit, and ADB is most happy uh, to do our best uh, to contribute as a success of this very important meeting by doing a couple of things. First, you know, alignments of our operation with the uh, Paris Agreement, uh, which uh, we discussed today. And second, uh, definitely uh, ramping up by ramping up. Uh, our climate financing, uh, which also we discussed today. And thirdly, uh, we uh, will definitely uh, uh, enhance our capacity building uh, uh, effort in our uh, developing member countries so that they can adopt more uh, aggressive uh, energy seas. And also we try to continuously try to provide our necessary resources for the MCs to introduce the uh, climate resilient technology uh, such as uh, renewable energy with stretch, uh, carbon capture, and uh, and also uh, smart grid uh, to make uh, their uh, economic structure less and less dependent on fossil fuels. Thank you so much indeed, President Massa, and thank you indeed to um, all the uh, panelists on this particular session, raising the bar on climate ambition, the road to COP26, heard a great deal, I learned a great deal. It's been my pleasure moderating this, I suppose. The takeaway message for me is no longer is it growth now and clean up later. It's um, early investment and action is better and cheaper than responding down the line. So I wish you all the best with your particular initiatives and ventures and your discussions at the 54th annual meeting of the ADB Board of Governors. But for now for me, excellencies, ladies and gentlemen, thank you very much indeed and goodbye. Thank you.